Today on Free Field Training, we're going to be talking about the law. We're going to talk about why people who say, I know the law, don't ever know what they're talking about. I'm going to give you some specific laws, some statutes on the books here in Illinois as examples. Obviously, this can't be legal advice because you're watching it on the internet. What kind of idiot would take their legal advice from some guy in his garage making a video on the internet? But I'm hoping this gives you a basic understanding of how law works, the levels of complexity in the law, and why it's important before you do something that's kind of stretching the limits of what the law is, you consult with a couple competent attorneys. Where are you going? Get out of the way! Now the reason most people don't know the law is because the law is so extensive anywhere you go. As a simple example, this law book, this is an actual law book that I have in front of me, for the state of Illinois, you would think with how thick this thing is, about two inches thick, that this was the book of all the criminal statutes or all the statutes or laws that are in the state of Illinois. In fact, this is the Illinois Vehicle Code. This is just the laws for when you're driving a car or a semi or registering a vehicle. Unless you think that this is some uh, large font book that has large spacing inside, when we open it up, this is what it looks like inside. It's like reading a dictionary. And it's the whole way through. It's not like this is just part of it. The whole thing, columns and six point font. It's insanely complex. And this is just the laws for cars. There's a three and a half to four inch thick book, depending on who makes it, for just the procedural and criminal law. The civil law, just for the state of Illinois, is mountains and mountains of books. And then on top of that, you have federal law and municipal statutes, all pertaining to the exact same things. So today we are going to take a look at one particular law to kind of give you an idea of within all of these statutes that you would have to look at to understand whether something's legal or not, how complex just one single statute gets. I'd like to point out at this juncture and before anybody goes absolutely bananas down in the comments section that no one is more keenly aware of how inconvenient and how ridiculous and what it says about both the criminal justice system and our society that laws really are far too expansive and far too complex for any one person to completely understand. I'm not saying this is the way I would build the system if it were mine to build if I was king, but it is the system that we have to work inside of and the system that we have to work with and I personally have to work with as a police officer and we need to all be able to know when we're making decisions on the street or making decisions about our everyday life how these different mechanisms work so that when we are trying to look up a law and we are trying to get good advice and determine what's good advice and what's bad advice on one particular topic that we can understand how these different things interact so if somebody tells us no you need to do this 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 and this and this and we look at it we go oh well it says or 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 that means I don't have to do all of those things we at least go get a second and a third opinion until we're sure of what's going on with it so I get all the time people ask me about why a police officer didn't know about a particular type of law and there are two types of guys that always seem to bring this up. One is the car guys and the other is the gun guys and since I'm a gun guy we are going to talk about the Illinois unlawful use of weapons laws as it pertains just to firearms. We're going to look at one small segment of it and we'll get more into that in a second. Now what those people always ask is they say, well, this cop locked this guy up for this reason and he didn't even know what the law was on yada yada. Whether that's how old the car has to be before you can import it into the country legally and register it on the road and be driving it when it's like right hand drive car or if it's about having a black powder cannon and why you don't need NFA paperwork for it. Those are very specific topics that most cops don't deal with on a daily basis and I'm hoping to show you why not only that cop doesn't know about that particular law, but no one can know about every law that's on the books on every little niche subject matter that you might run across on the street. And this is why we look things up. In fact, if you hire an attorney or you talk to an attorney about something that isn't what they deal with on an everyday basis and they don't look it up in a book before giving you advice about it, you need to fire that attorney. Every good attorney, every judge, when you go try a case at the Supreme Court, it takes them weeks to make a decision. During that time period, they're looking stuff up. Good attorneys look things up, good cops look things up before they make an arrest on it if they aren't 100% sure about what that law says. And we don't deal with all of these laws every single day. 
So let's get on our example here. ILCS 725-241A4. This is the Illinois Unlawful Use of Weapons Law. This is, again, not legal advice. It's just an example. It's one that I happen to be familiar with. And so I think it makes a good example of a couple of different concepts in law that I would like to point out to people. We're going to look at just guns, just what the state of Illinois classifies as guns. It's interesting to note this is ILC, this is 720 ILCS 524 1A4. There's three other statutes before this, and those have to do with uh, knives, blackjacks, bludgeons, things like that, other weapons. There are also statutes underneath it that are about explosives and other stuff of that nature. So the unlawful use of weapons law in, in Illinois reads as follows. A person commits the offense of unlawful use of weapons when he knowingly, and then there's one, two, and three having to do with knives and bludgeons and blackjacks, and then we get down to section four. Carries or possesses in any vehicle or concealed on or about his person, and then we'll stop there. So in Illinois, you have to carry knowingly, basically, one of these things. But before it tells you what those things are, it starts giving you exceptions, except when on his own land, his abode, legal dwelling, or fixed place of business, or in the land, or in the legal dwelling of another person, as an invitee of that per with that person's permission, and then it gets on to say, any pistol, revolver, stun gun, or taser, or other firearm, except that this subsection A4 does not do apply to or affect transportation of weapons that meet one of the following conditions. And then it starts listing exceptions where how you have that limit how you can transport firearms. So let's break this down in the simplest way we possibly can. So 720 ILCS 524-1A4 limits how you can carry a taser or firearm. Notice or, not and. In this case, most people don't mix up or or and because it's a taser or a firearm, we don't expect that people will be carrying both. And you have to do it knowingly. So if you're carrying a taser or a firearm knowingly and you are not on your own land or in your own abode, which means your house, it could also mean a parked semi if you're an over road truck driver, or in your own fixed place of business, it has to be a fixed place of business, so not a taxi cab, or in the abode of another with their permission. Now, before we get too much further on with this, we have to understand that these words mean things and they don't always carry the meanings that we associate with them from the dictionary, from English class, or from literature. For instance, in Illinois, taser and firearm are actually defined. And they are defined differently than they are defined in other states. And they are defined in this law sometimes differently than they are defined in other laws. In some states, a black powder gun is not considered a firearm. In Illinois, it is. If you carry a black powder firearm, this law applies. Now, you would think that the state would put these definitions directly into the statute so that you would know. You'd figure they would say, it's unlawful to carry a, fire, a weapon that discharges a lead projectile by means of burning powder or a burning propellant and they would put that directly to law, but they don't. They make you go look for it. It's in definitions, and you have to look above the law, way above the law, in the definitions for the entire chapter to find where it defines and how it defines a firearm or taser. In this case, a taser could mean almost anything that you electrocute people with. A, a stun gun all the way to a taser brand taser or one of the other ECDs that are out there, or a, and a firearm could mean anything from a powerful air rifle to an AK-47 and everything in between those two. And it's not just firearm or taser that gets defined in the statutes. Things like land, abode, fixed place of business, what constitutes a business, and what constitutes the abode of another person. Now these are written in a statute, but there's also case law that defines each one of them. For instance, I used to be a truck driver, as some of you know, and abode through case law also became, came to mean a park semi cab. If you have a sleeper cab and you park it somewhere, you are then good to carry or have in your possession a loaded firearm in Illinois, as far as I know right now. So even things that aren't in definitions can be 
kind of hinky on exactly where the law stands unless you start looking into case law. Now, once we know what the definitions of certain things are, we have to look at these ands and ors. And and or mean two different things, and oftentimes we can get confused by them. I've had people tell me with this, well, I'm the landlord, and yeah, this is this guy's house, but I own the land, so it's not his land, so he can't carry a gun inside the house. And here's the thing, the state law doesn't say that it has to be your land, your house, your home, your fixed place of business, and you have to have the permission of another person. It's, these aren't ands, these are ors. It means it has to be your land, or your house, or your fixed place of business, or with the permission of another person in their home. This seems pretty elementary to most people, but when we get on further down about particular exceptions in the law and for transporting firearms, you're going to see how and and or can sometimes be confused by people who really should know better, specifically police officers who aren't into firearms and didn't own them before they became a cop. The last point I want to talk about today is knowingly. A lot of people don't think about the knowingly factor in statutes. There are two types of laws. One of them is strict liability offenses. In a strict liability offense like speeding, it doesn't matter whether you knew you were speeding or not, you were speeding and so the prosecution doesn't have to prove that you knew you were doing something wrong. Another good example is uh, statutory rape. In statutory rape cases, in every state I'm aware of, that is a strict liability offense. Well, most offenses aren't strict liability. You have to knowingly, and very often you'll also see unlawfully. When it's offense against a person, you'll see the statute say unlawfully and without legal justification. Well, in this, there are legal justifications, but they're statutized in other places, such as the concealed carry law in Illinois, and so what we have is knowingly in there. The prosecution has to prove that you knew the gun or taser or other weapon was on your person or in your possession, and you weren't on your own land, in your own abode, in your fixed place of business, or in the abode of another person. Getting complicated yet? It's just beginning. Now you might ask yourself, how could they prove what I know. Well, they don't have to necessarily prove beyond any doubt that you knew the gun or taser or whatever else is illegal was in the car or in your possession at the time. What they have to do is prove to the judge that it is very, very likely that you knew. So for instance, if you've got the guy and he has a pistol shoved down his pants and he tries to say, well, this is my butt, these are my buddy's jeans, that's not gonna turn out so hot for him. No one's going to believe that it is reasonable that he doesn't know that the gun's there. Now, on the on the flip side of it, if he drives, let's say, you know, his buddy's car, it's not registered to him, he doesn't live at the same house as his buddy, and underneath the tire, locked down to the frame of the car, is a pistol that there's no way anybody could know was there just on glancing at the car, driving it, and driving it away. Let's say the guy had a really good excuse as to why he was driving the car that day. He was legitimately going to the hospital. There was a pistol underneath the spare tire in the trunk and somehow the police found it. And he would be able to come back and say, I didn't know that that firearm was there. What knowingly often comes down to is how credible your story as to why you didn't know it was there turns out to be. Again, lots of things with law come down to reasonableness and whatever the story is, either from the police or from you, about whether you knew it was there or didn't know you were there, has to be reasonable to the trier of fact, whether that is a judge or an attorney. Either way, this isn't really an issue for the street unless you're invoking the officer's discretion. Discretion is an issue that we're going to talk about in a later video. So to recap, if you're carrying a taser or firearm, which could mean a whole variety of things in the state of Illinois, depending on this statute, I believe in this statute, that includes black powder guns and fairly powerful air guns. If you carry them knowingly, except in your own land, in your own house, in your fixed place of business, or in the home of another with their permission, you're violating the law. Now, here's the thing. This doesn't cover transporting the firearm, which is written into this chapter and we're going to get to that next. So let's say you listen to all that and you say to yourself, Self, I understand now how I can have a gun in any particular place, but how I transport it in between places. If at my home and I'm going to carry the gun to the home of my friend, how would I do that? And in the statute it breaks it down. And here you're going to see the difference, the true difference between when we talk about or 
and and. And these are important in laws, you're going to see here in a second. The statute says that A4 does not apply if the gun is broken down into a non-functioning state or not immediately accessible or unloaded and in a case and is possessed by a person with a valid FOI card or the person that has a CCW permit under Illinois law. So what this is saying is that all the rules about not being able to possess a taser or a firearm don't apply if these things are followed. So in practice, it's a transport law. You can transport a firearm outside of your home, abode, fixed place of business, yada, 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 if the gun is broken down or, so it doesn't have to be both of these things, it, the gun doesn't have to be broken down, not immediately accessible and unloaded and in a case, it has to be broken down or not immediately accessible or unloaded and in a case. So it would have to be both unloaded and in a case to meet this criteria. And for all of these, it has to be for a person with a FOID card. A FOID card, for those of you who don't know, is a whole separate law that is even larger that says who can and can't own a gun in Illinois. And when you can't own a gun, they issue you a little card that says you can own a gun. It's pretty much a de facto like month and a half waiting period for your first firearm purchase topic for an entirely different show. So in practice, what does this mean? I hear people complain about this all the time because there's so many ors and ands all in the same sentence, and it's what makes it a really good example for us today. If you have a gun and you're transporting between your house and somebody else's house, and it's broken down into parts, you don't have to then put it inside a case. If it is not immediately accessible, so let's say the gun is in the locked trunk of your car or it's locked in a separate lockbox, you know, with the back corner of the car or whatever, not immediately accessible, you can't get it right away in order to be able to use it, or it is unloaded and put inside a case and you have a FOID card. Sometimes I will get people tell me that if you just unload the gun and put it in a case, but it's sitting in the seat next to you, well, hey, you can get arrested. I guess you could get arrested for anything. You could get arrested for no reason at all, realistically. People could seize you for something, for a mistake of the law, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to beat the case. We have to look at what's actually illegal. Now, people tell me all the time, they complain about this all the time because I'll say something like, well, if you unload the gun and you put it in a case, even if you don't have a concealed carry permit, you can carry it in the cab of your pickup truck. You know, if you have one of those two-door pickup trucks, it's something that comes up all the time. People are like, well, I can't leave it in the bed. Somebody will steal it, and I can't put it in the truck box because it's not waterproof. I've got to keep it in the cab. And they're like, well, unload it, put it in a case, you put it in the seat right next to you. They say, you can't do that. It says it's got to be not accessible. This isn't an and. This is an or, which means that as long as the gun's unloaded and it's in a case, it doesn't have to be not immediately accessible. It doesn't have to be broken down in individual components. But you do have to have a FOID card. Whether the gun's broken down in individual components, or it is just not accessible to the back of the car, or it's unloaded and put inside of the case, you have to have a FOID card no matter what. The other option is for you to have a CCW permit. Now, the CCW permit allows you to carry a handgun concealed or partially concealed in Illinois, again, that is a whole nother statute that is just as large and complex and demanding to understand as this one is. Again, just like A4, we then have to get into the definitions of the words that we're talking about. If you think this is pretty straightforward, when you read through, this law actually says the gun has to be unloaded or in a case or shipping container. It gives several things that it could be. But then we have to look into case law to understand how you can transport this gun. This is all well and good when you're in a car, but what if you're on foot? So next we're going to look into case law and how case law applies to statutes. Because the thing that I hear most from everybody is, I read the statute, I know what's legal. I read that statute. The thing is, if you don't look into the case law that defines what these different words means and the statute for what the definitions of the words are, then you're missing two-thirds of the meaning of what's going on. In this particular case, most of these we don't need the definitions for to understand, but the word case here for a long time was very very contentious. You see, a few years back before we had CCW law here in Illinois, 
the case thing became an issue, and there was a lot of case law on it. There was actually a case law out of one county where a flap holster, a military-style flap holster, was defined by the court as a case. And so a person carrying in, say, a safe packer or a fanny pack with a spare magazine either in the safe pack or in the fanny pack on them or on a magazine pouch with a gun in a flap holster, as long as it followed all the applicable uh, state law was legal. For a time there was a push toward that it was called uh, three seconds from safety. And uh, it went back and forth with that because it was only one county circuit court that said that that would be defined as a case and the other one said that they would fight it, which would mean it would have been a appellate court and maybe an Illinois Supreme Court issue on whether or not a safe pack or a fanny pack had become a case. As far as I know, there was never any uh, definitive ruling on it because the CCW law kind of made it obsolete to even think about why you'd want to do that. You just, if you could get a gun in Illinois, you can go through the class and get a carry license. And so it hasn't really become a thing since that happened. The other issue with cases was that conservation law in Illinois also applied to the very same thing, to transporting firearms. And so you could be just fine under 720 ILCS 5-24-184, a but not be just fine under the conservation law. And so if you got caught by the conservation police carrying into a conservation area, or if you were on a boat or something and you had a gun and it wasn't in a case that was covered by conservation law, which said that it had to be completely enclosed and zip tied or snapped inside the case, then you would be in violation of law. So this said that you could have a shipping container, you could just have a cardboard box. The conservation law said it had to be completely covered, it had to be zipped in, and it had to be a case that was specifically made to carry a firearm. So I'm sure you could see after going through all of that why things get pretty complicated. This is merely one subsection of one section of one area of one chapter of one part of the law and each of those parts of the law has books that are this big or larger six point font in them. But wait! There's more! Because anytime you have a law like this, especially about firearms, there's going to be exceptions. And here, I'll try to roll those on the screen now. There's exceptions in the law for peace officers, for federal agents, for security guards. There's exceptions in the law for military personnel when in the course of their official duties. There's exceptions in the law for all sorts of stuff where none of this stuff applies to these particular people in these particular circumstances. And there's a whole boatload of them. And I would never be able to rattle them off to you, which is why I'm not. I'd have to look them up. Most of them are pretty common sense and that's kind of what we have books and phones and Google for. That's kind of what we have the ability to look things up for is before we go arresting someone that we think, eh, this might be on the edge, you go look the thing up or you go call someone who might know. No one could know everything about every law. This unlawful use of weapon law in a book like this, six point font, two paragraphs, double wide paragraphs and columns, covers pages, and that's just for one thing. And the only reason that I can kind of muddle through understanding all of it is because it's my hobby. If you ask me the same thing about, let's say, classic cars and what the license plate requirements are for them, I would have to look it up. And any attorney that looked at it would have to look it up, and if the Justice of Supreme Court wanted to know, they would have to look it up too. No one goes and memorizes all of these laws. So I hope that helps you out a little bit with understanding the complexity that is involved with law. It's also important to note why you have to read this. You have to spend a lot of time studying it because it constantly, constantly changes. Things that I knew about this UUW law when I started being a police officer are no longer applicable to my job. The laws have changed. The, the concealed carry laws have changed. The taser portion wasn't in there. When I started, stun guns were perfectly all right to just, you just go to the corner store and buy them here in Illinois. And now they're considered a firearm, basically. A lot of things change, and so we have to stay up on top of them. So when somebody tells you they know the law, or if you're trying to figure out what a law is, you have to be very careful to look at the totality of what's going on. The statute is only one third of the law, the area where the law is written. Case law and reasonableness also have to come into play. 
When you're looking at something and you're thinking about doing it, if it rides the edges of a law, you still have to look at whether or not it's reasonable, whether a judge or jury is going to side with you that it was a good idea to do that or that you should be allowed to do that. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, you also have to understand that a lot of these things that are on the edges, the fringes of the law, have already been decided by case law. So if you go just by what the statute says, you're going to miss at least half of the meanings involved and described to the words. If this helped you guys out, you should check out my other videos in the playlist marked Police Training. And until next week, you guys be safe and take care of each other. I'd like to thank all the Patreon supporters and especially the shift supervisor level Patreon supporters that we have listed here. Your contributions are what allows free field training to continue on and become better. Thank you.